Here is a glimpse of a place still more unearthly from the novel World Without Stars. It is a planet of a dim red dwarf sun which lies alone in intergalactic space. Thus natives see the entire galaxy huge in their skies and some of them make it their deity. God was rising in the west and this time the sun was down. Only lately a few clouds were still red above the eastern treetops against purple dust. But over the hours that light had waned until it was little more than an echo of what now swung above Lake Silence so that his pale glory stood clear to be adored. The peck could not all make worship. They had met on a ridge near the lairs and howled when the fingers of God's foremost arm glimmered into view. But he would take long to mount so high that his entire self was revealed. The he's must hunt, the she's reek, the young's gather, lest God's coursers perish. Moreover and worse, the whole pack unmoving here, so distant from their hills, could draw the notice of a down devil out of the sea depths. And night or no, the down devil might then send a war fleet of the herd, if indeed that which had lately arrived in fire and thunder was not enemy work itself. Yaquila, the one, had brought some bold followers who would go with him to see about that. But first he stood as watch of homage on behalf of the whole folk. Slowly, slowly, God climbed into heaven. Yaquila crouched on the back of Crooked Rock and sang. He sang the welcome and the praise and the strength. Then the last coals of sunset went out, and the sky was empty of everything save God, the angels, and three planets. And God cast a white glade from the world's edge, down the width of Lake Silence until it was lost among the reeds at this shore. The night was still and cool. A breeze gusted, smelling of damp. A fish leaped in a single clear splash. A wing cried its lonely note. Reeds rustled and were answered by the inland brush. But otherwise, Yaquila and God had darkness to themselves. He stopped a while to rest and eat. He was hoarse, the rock was harsh beneath his webs and tail, and weariness dragged at him. Yes, he thought, I grow old, but I am yet the one at the pack. A distant boom made him start. Drums? It was not impossible for the herd to come raiding by night, but it was rare. The down devils feared God, and so their worshippers did too. Only a twyhorn off an umber swamp, he decided. He looked west again and was astonished to see God's body flame in sight. Why, I must have dozed, he thought in dismay. Does that mean anything other than that I am in truth old? Hastily, he went through the invocations and gestures he had missed until he was caught up. The legends haunted him about creatures that had long ago come from the sky and returned to herd day or pack night, who knew, save God and the down devils. Were these unknown newcomers at Balefire Head, whom he must presently seek out, the same ones? More than ever, the world needed shielding against strangeness. I call to thee, we call to thee, thou who castest out the sun, arise, arise, arise. Although I think probably the universe is rich in life, Still, there is no denying that most celestial bodies are most likely barren. However, these too have their glories, as we are learning within our own solar system. Here is a scene from the novella Star Fog. In the far future, a group of people have landed on a world at the edge of a great star cluster. Yes, yonder is our home sky. The physicist Hern Oren's son spoke slow and hushed. Cosmic interference seethed across his radio voice, night drowning it in Lars and Grey Doll's earplugs. No, the ranger said, not off there. We're already in it. What? Silvery against rock, the two space-armored figures turned to stare at him. He could not see their expressions behind the faceplates, but he could imagine how astonishment flickered above all. He paused, arranging words in his mind. The star noise in his receivers was like surf and fire. The landscape overwhelmed him. Here was no simple airless planet. No planet is ever really simple, and this one had a stranger history than most. Eons ago, it was apparently a subjovian, with a cloudy hydrohelium and methane atmosphere and an immense shell of ice and frozen gases around the core. For it orbited its sun at a distance of almost a billion and a half kilometers. And though that primary was bright, at this remove it could be little more than a spark. Until stellar evolution, hastened, Lor believed, by an abnormal infall of cosmic material, took the star off the main sequence. It swelled, 
surface cooling to red, but total output growing so monstrous that the inner planets were consumed. On the farther ones, like this, atmosphere fled into space. Ice melted, the world ocean boiled. Each time the pulsations of the sun reached a maximum, more vapor escaped. Now nothing remained except a ball of metal and rock hardly larger than a terrestrial type globe. As the pressure of the top layers was removed, frightful tectonic forces must have been liberated. Mountains, the younger ones with crags like sharp teeth, the older ones worn by meteorite and thermal erosion, rose from a cratered plain of gloomy stone. Currently at a minimum, but nonetheless immense, a full seven degrees across, blue core surrounded and dimmed by the tenuous ruddy atmosphere, the sun smoldered aloft. Its furnace light was not the sole illumination. Another star was passing sufficiently near at the time that it showed a perceptible disk. In a stop-down view screen, because no human eye could directly confront that electric cerulean intensity. The outsider was a B-8, newborn out of dust and gas, blazing with an intrinsic radiance of a hundred souls. Neither one helped in the shadows cast by the pinnacled upthrust which Lars Party was investigating. Flashcasters were necessary. But more was to see overhead, astride the dark. Stars in thousands powdered the sky, brilliant with proximity. And they were the mere fringes of the cluster. It was rising as the planet turned, partly backgrounding and partly following the sun. Lar had never met a sight to compare. For the most part, the individuals he could pick out in that enormous spheroidal cloud of light were themselves red. Long-lived dwarfs, dying giants like the one that brooded over him but many glistened exuberant golden, emerald, sapphire. Some could not be older than the blue which wandered past and added its own harsh hue to this land. All those stars were studded through a soft glow that pervaded the entire cluster, a nacreous luminosity into which they faded and vanished, the fog wherein his companions had lost their home, but which was a shining beauty to behold. You live in a wonder, Lor said. Great all moved toward him, she said low. Space is eldritch and dangerous. But once on Kirk ascent, we will watch the sun go down in the rainbow desert. Suddenly in that thin air, night has come, our shimmering star-crowded night and the auroras dance and whisper above the stark hills. We will see great flying flocks rise from dawn mists over the salt marshes, hear their wings thunder and their voices flute. We will stand on the battlements of A, under the banners of those very knights who long ago rid the land of the fire garms and watch the folk dance welcome to a new year. Discovery by discovery, we are coming to realize how strange the universe is. No writer now living can do more than hint at this, for we know too little. Nevertheless, I have tried, as in the following passage from Tau Zero. Because of being trapped into traveling almost at the speed of light, so that time aboard was enormously contracted, the spaceship Leonora Christina and her crew have flown through the entire future of the cosmos, until at last it has stopped expanding, has fallen in on itself, and is about to become a new chaos from which it will make a new beginning. Leonora Christina shouted, shuddered, and leaped. Space flamed around her, a firestorm, hydrogen aglow from that supernal sun which was forming at the heart of existence, which burned brighter and brighter as the galaxies rained down into it. The gas hid the central travail behind sheets, banners, and spears of radiance, aurora, flame, lightning. Forces unmeasurably vast tore through and through the atmosphere. Electric, magnetic, gravitational, nuclear fields, shock waves bursting across megaparsecs, tides and currents and cataracts. On the fringes of creation through billion year cycles which passed as moments, the ship of man flew. Flew. There was no other word. As far as humanity was concerned, or the most swiftly computing and reacting of machines, she fought a hurricane. But such a hurricane as had not been known since last the stars were melted together and hammered afresh. Yah! screamed Len Kay and rode the ship down the trough of a wave whose crest shook loose a foam of supernovae. The haggard men on the steering bridge with him stared into the screen that had been built for this hour. What raged in it was not reality. Present reality transcended any picturing or understanding, but a display of exterior force fields burned and roiled and spewed great sparks and globes. It bellowed in the metal of the ship in flesh and skulls. Can't you stand any more? Raymond shouted from his own seat. Barrios, relieve him. The other jet man shook his head. 
He was too stunned, too beaten from his previous watch. Okay, Raymond unharnessed himself. I'll try. I've handled a lot of different types of craft. No one heard him through the fury around, but all saw him fight across the pitching, whirling deck. He took the auxiliary control chair on the opposite side of Lenke from Barrios and laid his mouth close to the pilot's ear. Face me in. Lenke nodded. Together, their hands moved across the board. They must hold Leonora Christina well away from the growing monoblock, whose radiation would otherwise surely kill them. At the same time, they must stay where the gas was so dense that Tal could continue to decrease for them, turning these final Phoenix giga years into hours. And they must keep the ship riding safely through a chaos that, did it ever strike her full on, would rip her into nuclear particles. No computers, no instruments, no precedents might guide them. It must be done on instinct and trained reflex. Gradually, Raymond entered the pattern until he could steer it alone. The rhythms of rebirth were wild, but they were there. Ease on starboard. Vector at nine o'clock low. Now push that thrust. Break a little here. Don't let her broach. Swing wide of that flame cloud if you can. Thunder brawled. The air was sharp with ozone and cold. The screen blanked. An instant later, every fluoro panel in the ship turned simultaneously ultraviolet and infrared, and blackness plunged down. Those who lay harnessed alone throughout the hull heard invisible lightnings walk the corridors. Those in command bridge, pilot bridge, engine room, who manned the ship, felt a heaviness greater than planets. They could not move nor stop a movement once begun, and then felt a lightness such that their bodies began to shake asunder. And this was a change in inertia itself, in every constant of nature as space-time matter energy underwent its ultimate convulsion. For a moment, infinitesimal and infinite, men, women, child, ship, and death were one. It passed so swiftly that they could not tell if it had been. Light came back and outside vision. The storm grew fiercer, but now through it, seen distorted so that they appeared to be blue-white fire drops that broke into sparks as they flew, fountaining off in two huge curving sheets, now came the nascent galaxies. The monoblock had exploded. Creation had begun. Raymond went over to full deceleration. Leonora Christina started slowly to slow, and she flew out into a reborn light. I do quite seriously think that spaceflight is our next evolutionary step. If we do not take it, we are doomed to decay, misery, and eventual extinction here upon Earth, unless we commit racial suicide faster than that. In the outside universe is our hope, and the hope, too, of our mother planet. Consider how much pressure we can take off her. However, nothing is free. Every advance has its cost, which is often bitter. That will remain true in time to come. People will suffer and die in space, and other people who love them will wonder if the gain was worth the price. There has to be an answer which goes beyond the material and invokes the spirit. This last passage is the final chapter of the novel, The Enemy Stars. The North Atlantic rolled in from the west, gray and green and full of thunder. A wind blew white manes up on the waves. Low to the south gleamed the last autumnal daylight, and clouds massed iron-colored in the north brewing sleet. There, pointed Tamara, that is the place. McLaren slanted his air car earthward. The sky whistled around him. So Dave had come from here. The island was a grim enough rock, harshly ridged. But Dave had spoken of gorse in summer and heather in fall and lichen of many hues. The girl caught McLaren's arm. I'm afraid, Tarangi, she whispered. I wish you hadn't made me come. It's all we can do for David, he told her. The last thing we'll ever be able to do for him. No. In the twilight, he saw how her head lifted. There's never an end. Not really. His child and mine waiting, and at least we can put a little sense into life. I don't know whether we do or whether we find what was always there, he replied. Nor do I care greatly. To me, the important thing is that the purpose, order, beauty, spirit, whatever you want to call it, does exist. Here on Earth, yes, she sighed, a flower or a baby. But then three men die beyond the sun, and it so happens the race benefits a little from it. But I keep thinking about all those people who simply die out there, or come back blind, crippled, broken like dry sticks with no living soul the better for it. 
why? I've asked it and asked it, and there isn't ever an answer. And finally, I think that's because there isn't any why to it in the first place. McLaren set the car down on the beach. He was still on the same search along a different road. He had not come here simply to offer David's father whatever he could, reconciliation at least, and a chance to see David's child now and then in the years left him. McLaren had some obscure feeling that an enlightenment might be found on Skula. Truly enough, he thought, men went to space as they had gone to sea, and space destroyed them, and still their sons came back. The lure of gain was only a partial answer. Spacemen didn't get any richer than sailors had. Love of adventure, well, in part, in some men, and yet by and large the conquerors of distance had never been romantics. They were workaday folk who lived and died among sober realities. When you asked a man what took him out to the Black Star, he would say he had gone under orders, or that he was getting paid, or that he was curious about it, or any of a hundred reasons, which might all be true. And yet, was any of them the truth? And why, McLaren wondered, did man, the race, spend youth and blood and treasure and all high hopes upon the sea and the stars? Was it only the outcome of meaningless forces, economics, social pressure, maladjustment, myth, whatever you labeled it, a set of chance-created vectors with the sardonic resultant that man broke himself trying to satisfy needs which could have been more easily and sanely filled at home? If I could get a better answer than that, thought McLaren, I could give it to Tamara and to myself, and then we could bury our dead. He helped her out of the car, and they walked up a path toward the ancient-looking cottage. Light spilled from its windows into a dusk heavy with surf. But they had not quite reached it when the door opened and a man's big form was outlined. Is that you, Technic McLaren, he called. Yes. Captain Magnus Ryerson? McLaren stepped ahead of Tamara and bowed. I took the liberty, sir, of bringing a guest with me whom I did not mention when I called. I can guess, said the tall man. It's all right, lass. Come in and welcome. As she passed over the uneven floor to a chair, Tamara brushed McLaren and took the opportunity to whisper, how old he's grown all at once. Magnus Ryerson shut the door again. His hands, ropey with veins, shook a little. He leaned heavily on a cane as he crossed the room and poked up the fire. Be seated, he said to McLaren. When I knew you were coming, I ordered some whiskey from the mainland. I hope it's a good make. I drink not, you see, but be free to do so yourself. McLaren looked at the bottle. He didn't recognize the brand. Thank you, he said. That's a special favorite of mine. You've eaten? asked the old man anxiously. Yes, thank you, sir. McLaren accepted a glass. Ryerson limped over the floor to give Tamara one. Can you stay the night? I've some extra beds in the garret from when the fisher lads would come by. They come no more. There's no reason for it now, but I've kept the beds. McLaren traded a look with Tamara. We would be honored, he said. Magnus Ryerson shuffled to the hob, took the tea kettle, poured himself a cup and raised it. Your help. He sat down in a worn chair by the fire. His hands touched a leather-bound book lying on its arm. There was silence for a while, except that they could all hear the waves boom down on the strand. McLaren said finally, I, we, I mean, we came to, to offer our sympathy. And if there was anything I could tell you, I was there, you know. I, your kind, Ryerson groped after a pipe. It is my understanding he conducted himself well. Yes, of course he did. Then that's what matters. I'll think of a few questions later if you give me time. But that was the only important one. McLaren looked around the room. Through its shadows, he saw pilot's manuals on the shelves, stones and skins and gods brought from beyond the sky. He saw the Syrian binary like twin hells upon darkness, but they were very beautiful. He offered, your son was in your own tradition. Better, I hope, said the old man. There would be little sense to existence that boys have no chance to be more than their fathers. Tamara stood up. But that's what there isn't, she cried all at once. There's no sense. There's just dying and dying and dying. What for? So that we can walk on still another planet, learn still another fact? What have we gained? What have we really done? And why? In your own God's name, what did we do once that he sends our men out there now? She clamped her hands together. They heard how the breath rasped in her. She said at last, I'm sorry, and sat back down. Her fingers twisted blind until McLaren took them. Magnus Ryerson looked up, and his eyes were not old. 
He let the serfs snarl on the rocks of his home for a while, and then he answered her, for that is our doom and our pride. What? She started. Oh, in English. Terengi, he means, she said it in interhuman. McLaren sat quite still. Ryerson opened his book. They have forgotten Kipling now, he said. One day they will remember. For no people live long who offer their young men naught but fatness and security. Tomorrow, lass, let your son hear this one day. It is his song, too. He is human. The words were unknown to McLaren, but he listened and thought that in some dark way he understood. We have fed our sea for a thousand years, and she calls us still unfed, though there's never a wave of all her waves but marks our English dead. We have strawed our best to the weeds, unrest to the shark and the shearing gull. If blood be the price of admiralty, Lord God, we have paid in full. When Ryerson had finished, McLaren stood up, folded his hands, and bowed. Sensei, he said, give me your blessing. What? The other man leaned back into shadows, and now he was again entirely old. You could scarcely hear him under the waves outside. You have not to thank me for, lad. No, you gave me much, said McLaren. You have told me why men go, and it isn't for nothing. It is because they are men.